I'm really excited to be teaching this subject because it's something that really excites me and how it has like really helped me in my life. And so I think it's so very important for us to know about it as women and to teach our children. And um, so it's nice to see other people excited about this. And um, so I am a, a midwifery student right now. I'm studying to be a home birth midwife. Um, I live in Berkeley, I'm married, um, and I have four children. Um, I had all my children uh, at home, um, and I also have practiced like um, fertility awareness through my whole history of menstruating. So for me, it's something really practical that I have really experienced and hopefully can share with you guys. Um, what else? I am also a doula right now. So I attend births as a midwifery assistant at home births or birth center births. And I'm also working as a doula. So for labor support for women in any setting. Um, and I'm a childbirth educator. Um, so right now, actually, I'm doing a series for Muslim um, pregnant women, um, teaching them about childbirth education. So this is, this is my draft of a book that, is, um, that I'm teaching out of right now. But it's, um, it's been really fun. So alhamdulillah. And something I wish I had when I was having babies. <laughs> but alhamdulillah, there's a lot of good information out there. Yeah. Let me just see. I'm supposed to be in contact with Brother Munir by text if I need to. So <laughs> I was like, is he texting me? Um, what inspired me? So I was born at home, and all of my family pretty much just is like very, very aware of like natural birth. And, um, you know, we breastfed all our kids and was very, very much a part of our, our upbringing. So, um, and I think just in general, I was always interested in like um, like alternative healing methods and just support for women. And so then when I had, and then I, through the years I was living in Syria for like eight years, getting my um, bachelor's in Islamic studies. Oh, that's what I didn't add. I'm a Quran teacher as well. Um, getting my bachelor's in Islamic studies and I was also help, had the opportunity to help several women um, what they were having. Uh, home births there. Um, so, so then after having my own kids, I really saw the importance like firsthand of like, wow, like women, it really makes a big difference when you have help. It really makes a big difference when you like, um, have help. <laughs> and, and, you know, like even thinking of like hospital births, it's, it makes a big difference when you have someone who knows the ropes and can kind of like speak the language and, and you know, because it's like a major learning curve having kids and, and like um, trying to raise them and, and trying to birth them and all that. So, um, yeah, and then I think at, at, at one point, I, at, like when I had my fourth child, I um, had the midwife that I had was just someone that I really thought I could be like. So it really made me feel like, oh, I could do that. Like, to me, a midwife is like, oh, she's like the most amazing thing. <laughs> this woman that's like an angel. I was like, okay, I'm not an angel, so that's a bit above me, but alhamdulillah. So, um, yeah, so alhamdulillah, I've been learning, and it's been really nice. Yeah. Alhamdulillah. So we have a lot to talk about. Um, this is like a really, really broad topic. Um, so I'm just going to try to jump right in. A lot of the handouts are up here, so maybe you guys are going to have to get up and down and get them. But um, as we go, and you'll probably want to be taking notes if you have paper, and I don't think I have any to share. So um, maybe I know if you take some of the handouts, then you could write on the back. Um, yeah, so maybe just take. So these are like a group. These, well, there's actually enough people that they, yeah, why don't you guys just get your handouts and then you'll have something to write on. Um, okay. 
So, yeah, so these are like two, uh, wait, wait, it's the whole pile. Uh, yeah, like that. And then these are like the, these, and then, um, we'll just hold out on those. Yeah. So it's like the whole, um, I staggered it so that, yeah. And then you got that, and then the first two, yeah. Inshallah. And then we'll hold out on these. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, if you want to be part of my mailing list, and I know there's one handout that I didn't, um, yeah, it's like, you see how I did it? There's three, yeah. Yeah, did that one have three papers in there? And then this is another. Okay, and did you get these? Okay. Yeah, and if anyone wants to sign this, the email list, I have, um, you know, trying to put out like a newsletter whenever I go. Those are two. Whenever I do something. So, to get in my cards over here as well. Thank you. Does anyone need a pen? I have some extras. Yeah? Yeah. If it doesn't work, let me know. Oh, I don't know if, how I would write if I, I feel like I'm attached to so much equipment. <laughs> Let's see. Um, all right. Let's see. Is that? Some of the um, handouts I don't think I'm going to have enough of, but here's um, these and these. Um, yeah. So this is a group of handouts, and then this is another one for the sister. So I'm not going to have... Um, there's some missing. So if anyone has missing handouts, I'll just email them to you. Um, yeah, she has two more than you don't that you don't have, or three more that you don't have. But you guys can share maybe until I can get them to you, inshallah. All right. So the the first thing I wanted to talk about is like the female hormone cycle in general, like what is going on every month, right? So if you, I think you guys have this handout. We'll see if we can just go out by the handouts. It's kind of high tech looking, um, but maybe you guys have already seen this information before. <clears throat> All right. So the menstrual, the hormonal cycle of women is like broken up into three different phases, right? So we have the menstrual phase, right? We start with menstruation on this, like, right? If your doctor says, what was the first day of your last cycle? You're going to say the first day you menstruated on, right? So that's your menstrual phase. And, right? So we menstruate. And then the next phase is follicular phase. Um, and... Is it? Okay, so it is written on this handout. So it's like on the side, follicular. Um, so that, it refers to the follicle. So that's when the egg is growing and maturing, right? Getting ready to ovulate, right? Um, so that's the follicular phase. So then after that, you ovulate. And then after ovulation, you have the luteal phase. And what's happening when you ovulate is that the, the egg has um, grown inside the ovary, right? The egg is growing inside the ovary, and it's um, getting more mature, and it has like a, almost like a sac around the egg. So that sac bursts and ovulates, lets that egg out into the fallopian tubes, and that, what's left over of that outer lining that sac is a, um, it's called a lute, it's like a lutea album. 
it's it's that tissue starts to produce progesterone right and that tissue that's left over from hatching the egg out of it actually takes over the hormone production for the rest of the until you um, menstruate again so it's called the luteal phase because it's referring to that sac that the egg had come out of right um, and so after you've ovulated and the egg dies within 12 to 24 hours after ovulation, then that, um, then you're no longer fertile until, until your ovulation the next month, right? Is there any, does that make sense? Any questions up to this point? All right, so... Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah, so you menstruate, then you have a period of like, of uh, the egg is uh, developing, right? So you're becoming more closer and closer towards your ovulation, right? And then, and then you ovulate. Then you have the luteal phase that is, that you're no longer fertile. Is finished, yeah, yeah. You're no longer fertile. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what it's saying here, in terms of possibility, is because you don't. The, what's hard to know when you're trying to figure out when you're ovulating, when you're fertile, is when you're going to ovulate. You know that, inshallah, like people who ovulate regularly, they know they're going to ovulate sometime in here, but they don't necessarily, they can't necessarily pinpoint the day because it fluctuates each cycle. Like, so normally women, maybe their, flux, their cycle length changes by a day or two or so each month. So you might like, oh, normally I ovulate on the 12th day, but this month I actually ovulated on the 10th day. So then your fertility was actually earlier than you had anticipated. Yeah, exactly. Um, so the thing is, is that you cannot, the egg can't be fertilized. It, it, the egg only lasts 12 to 24 hours, but the sperm, can last up to five days. So that's really where the extended period of time happens because say, if you had intercourse five days earlier, and if someone doesn't mind seeing if that's someone trying to, I don't know, it could be kids, but um, if it's five days earlier, then you can still get pregnant if you ovulate five days later. Mm -hmm. So really, like if you're really trying not to get pregnant, then you're going to be cautious, very cautious, before your ovulation. Yeah, once you ovulate, you're like, okay, I'm done. Like, there's no way I'm going to get pregnant. Yeah. Once you're sure. No? No one there. Oh, is that? Oh, okay. You guys are all courageous to ask, right? <laughs> Anyways, well, I actually have the option to turn off the recording, so I was going to do that if we want, felt like that was needed. I mean, like, I don't mind you guys just asking any question, and it's totally fine. I mean, I think there's sisters online, but if you want to ask a personal question, then keep it till the end, and I'll turn off the recording. <laughs> yeah. This is, like, interesting topic for the masjid. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, so if this is clear, um, we want to look at this next handout, which is talking about what exactly the hormones are doing during ovulation. So this one, during the whole cycle, actually. The length of your cycle, uh-huh. Yeah, so, absolutely. So every woman is totally different. 
um, the, I'm not sure like what the normal range is, but there's a very large range. And it's really interesting why like in Islam, like the shortest clean period that you can have is 15 days in most of the madhavs, it's 13 days in the hanbalis. Um, but when you think of that, like, okay, you had your menses, you had one, say you ovulate really, really early and you had one day, that first day you ovulated on, then you had the average time. Most, most women have 14 days from the time they ovulate to the time they get their menses. And that's mostly, um, that's pretty set with women. So normally, like, that's not going to change. If you have, like, prolonged stress in your life, then you might, like, change your luteal phase length. But for most women, that's, like, set. Soon as you, if you know you ovulated the, and then you count 14 days, it's almost like clockwork. Okay, my period just like appears right then. Um, so, but some women, there's a range of ovulation time between 12 days and 16 days. So what's normal is between that 12 day and 16 day window, most women on the 14, uh, 14 days before their period, they would ovulate with some 12, between 12 and 16 days. So, um, so it makes sense why 15 days would be the normal time where you would have like a regular um, break between menses and that would be considered normal. And the 13 days in the Hanbalis makes a lot of sense because there are those women that have like a 12 day luteal phase and then they would actually have a 13 day tohar, a like clean phase between menses and it would totally be legit. Like it would be their normal cycle. It wouldn't be something that was abnormal. Um, so, inshallah. Yeah, so the length um, varies. And mostly what varies, like I said, is the follicular phase. So some women, maybe they like have a menstruation like every 34 days or something. What's longer is usually that wait before they ovulate, not after, right? Because the after is usually pretty set, right? And, okay, so we're looking at this next um, paper here. And so what it's talking about is the hormones. And so really what, uh, during menstruation, the hormones are pretty much like both estrogen, progesterone, is all like very low, right? And that's what makes us bleed because an, a low progesterone, basically progesterone is telling your body to have this like nice comfy blanket inside your womb to hold the baby. So your progesterone goes down and your body's like, okay, we don't need that anymore. Circulation gets cut off to all this tissue that has built up to feed the baby and then like it turns into blood and comes out. So, um, so what's happening in the beginning when you're developing the egg is not the progesterone to keep it, it's the estrogen to get the egg to develop and to ovulate. So your estrogen is, is coming up, right? And then um, these other hormones, the luteinizing hormone and FSH, follicle stimulating hormones, those have to do with right at ovulation. So those those have to do with right at ovulation. Um, and then as soon as you ovulate, your progesterone goes up. So then at, in the luteal phase, your progesterone production is higher than the estrogen. And what did we say produces the progesterone? I know I didn't give you a good name for it, but this, um, that tissue that's the lute, luteus, yeah, I should get the name for that. <laughs> that weird thing in there. That, anyways, so the life cycle of that, once it deteriorates all the way, it, it doesn't produce the progesterone, your body menstruates. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that, that is this one. And why is this significant to us? Like, what does it matter what our hormones are doing? Um, well, one, it tells us, like, if things aren't going smoothly and normally and clock, like clockwork, and then 
maybe it's because one of these are off balance, right? Um, but also, a lot of women, if they're trying to figure out when they ovulated, what they'll do is they'll take their temperature every day. And um, what they'll do is take their temperature, it's called the the basal body temperature, which is your temperature at rest. So normally you would take it like as soon as you wake up in the morning, you have to like at least have three hours of sleep um, to like be in a restful state um, completely. And then you would take your temperature before you moved or anything, right? Um, and then you would have your resting temperature. And so what happens in this um, picture down here, uh, what happens is the um, when progest when your hormones switch to progesterone, your um, temperature will rise. So you can actually see that on your temperature chart that you're getting higher readings. And it's not going to look as, as nice and um, smooth as these lines, but that gives you a good idea. It's going to look more like the next paper that you're getting up and down, up and down, up and down, and then you're like, oh, higher, up and down, up and down, up and down. But it's all on the tenth of the, of the degree. So you have to get like a very accurate um, thermometer, but also a slow read thermometer. So it can't be like, oh, those thermometers, like in 15 seconds you can have your temperature. There's like special basal body temperature uh, thermometers that will read, it like takes one minute or like at least 30 seconds to get like an actual uh, true temperature. Because the way the other ones work, it's just, it, it gives you the reading after 15 seconds, but if it would have waited longer, it would have maybe adjusted it a little bit to the accurate um, one. So it's, they're not as accurate, right? Um, so, so that's why women will take their temperature because they want to see that when their temperatures are higher. And, um, and then you also can see, it does show whether you're pregnant or not because if your temperatures don't go back to your normal um, when you're menstruating and they just stay higher, that means that you're still producing progesterone. And what happens if you get pregnant then your the placenta will take over production of of progesterone, and you'll have a lot of progesterone in your pregnancy because progesterone keeps the baby in, right? It keeps your uterus from contracting. It keeps everything nice and wonderful for the baby. So, um, yeah, your temperature won't go back down to like its non luteal phase temperature. It'll just stay high. Um. So, yeah, so the, the, what are the signs of fertility? So we talked about hormones, right, taking your temperature and to know which hormones you're producing at that time. The other sign of which, of where you're at, I mean, obviously we know if we're menstruating or not, but whether we're in our follicular phase or the luteal phase, um, is our cervical mucus. So that fun stuff. That we all <laughs> right so we have uh, handouts about this okay so cervical mucus is right so we are ha we have um, moisture in general in our our birth canal right that's not cervical mucus you're gonna have moisture whether all the time right like you just our body cavity has moisture, right? It's like inside of your mouth, you have moisture. Um, when your cervix is producing mucus um, and because of fertility, it's a special kind of discharge you're going to get. It's going to be increasingly, um, uh, like uh, increasingly more in quantity. It's going to be like um, almost like egg whites, stretchy, Right, um, and that mucus is actually, subhanAllah, Allah made it food for sperm, right? So if, um, 
so your body is getting ready to be fertile so it's putting out this food for the sperm and the, and this mucus is is a lot made it so that it actually has like running paths so that the sperm can like penetrate the cervix easily it's like the way that the structure is it has like these paths that it can It has paths to swim up. So um, the so that's why it's like raw egg whites. It's clear, stretchy, um, and it could just be feel wet, and it can be. It's very lubricative, right? Um, if you're not having fertile mucus, then it's more like paste, right, or just moisture. Like if you put your hand in your hair and it's just like, oh, it's just like wetness, but there's not like something there, right? So that's just your moisture, right? So the cervical fluid is, it, mucus is something that will build, like so um, you'll become more and more and more fertile. So you can maybe notice, you might go from your menses right into fertile mucus, but some people have a break where it's just like, oh, there's nothing, and then they'll start to have fertile mucus. So that means that if they're trying not to get pregnant, they should pay attention that, oh, I'm, I'm becoming fertile. So it will build up over time, over the days, and then your most fertile day, like where you have this, the most mucus is likely the day that you would ovulate, and then after that it would decline over a couple of days. Um, so, and it's not necessarily as accurate in terms of pinpointing the exact time. All of these are kind of like you're you're using these multiple signs at one t at one time to to really try to figure out like when is the ovulation. The other sign is on this other page, which is the cervix. So if you were to um, feel your cervix, then you would um, during during your fertile time, the cervix is softer. So normally it's like harder, it's more stiff, um, where if it's, you're fertile, it would be more like your lips, then your nose is like more stiff, right? It would be softer, it would be uh, higher up in the vaginal canal, and more centrally um, located. So um, maybe straight down rather than being um, tilted. Um, and if you're not fertile, it was more firm, cervix is positioned lower in the birth canal and angled and it's not as open right because your body is trying to get pregnant every month right for people who ovulate regularly it's trying to get pregnant so it's going to open up it's going to make all this mucus and do all this stuff to make it easy for the sperm to get inside and fertilize. Okay. So those are the major signs of ovulation. Um, then um, secondary signs, some women get um, like uh, pain, like almost like cramps on maybe only the side that they're ovulating on, right? Because you get, like, you have two ovaries, so on the side that you ovulate on one side one month and the other side the other month. So you, the side that you're ovulating on, you might feel kind of crampy, um, or it might be on both sides at, simultaneously. Um, and uh, um, usually uh, you're emotionally, you have higher libido, um, your moods, you might feel like um, feelings of grief or letting go. Uh, I don't know. I've never experienced that, so I don't know what that feels like <laughs> when you're ovulating. Um, but some women have that. Um, and then there's rare women. 3% of women get some spotting when they're ovulating. Um, uh, they might have 
they might have swelling in their um, genitalia, heightened senses, and maybe sensitivity in their nipples. Um, yeah. All right. So, are there any questions about that so far? The concept of PMS. Mm. Um, I mean, it definitely has to do with your hormones. And as far as I understand, like all of the, most of the discomforts of menstruation are not actually good signs of health, right? There's signs that maybe you do have an off balance because it, in an ideal health, it shouldn't hurt and it shouldn't um, cause you extreme mood swings and things like that. Not that it shouldn't affect you in some way, but it shouldn't be like you're in bed and in pain, you know? Um, so it's something to look at on a, I know like probably in the medical, um, in the allopathic approach, which is our dominant medical system here, it's not considered something wrong with you, but like probably in a more holistic approach, if you went to a, a someone who specialized in that, then they would, you know, see, maybe have some help for those things. But um, one thing, and I don't know if a lot of sisters have heard about this, is vaginal steaming. That actually really can help with a lot of, like, almost any gynecological symptoms if you have them, you should try steaming before you try anything else because <laughs> it can, like, dramatically help people's health. Yeah. Mm -hmm. like menstrual cramps, like your period's too long, your period's too short, you have, like, um, anything, infections, endometriosis, sensitivities, like, mm. Mm -hmm. Like um, like when you're menstruating, yeah. Mm. Like you're achy and stuff. Yeah, I mean it helps with like everything. So, um, basically the steaming is like one. It's so you're sitting over a pot of um, of herbs like a tea that's steaming, and the steam is going on your bottom. Right. And what it's doing is one, it's like opening up your it's like the steam is penetrating up into your birth canal and into your cervix. It's like opening up like if we do a steam bath on our face, we like it opens our pores. It also will do that down there. And so if you have like stagnant blood or like you're not um, emptying out all the way you have like blood clots you have like really dark blood because period blood should be bright red it should be like flowing it shouldn't be like uh, like kind of hard to get out and painful so sometimes it's just like it's opening up and like helping you to get all the blood circulation down there and to just like be able to like eliminate your period every month um, and then the other thing that it's doing is um, is your, uh, it's like, um, what's it called? So the nervous system, it's calming your nervous system. So your nerves, right, are like running all the way through your body, but you have like really strong nerves like in your vag, it's called the vagal nerve. So it's, the end of it is in your bottom, right? And the top of it's like in your head, right? So um, to, to like relax the bottom of it is going to like make you really happy. <laughs> like it just like, it's kind of like, um, what is it? It's calming your system. So it's going to like affect like a lot of things. Yeah. I mean that people use it for like uh, sexual trauma because it's like actually is like helping to calm your nervous system. So it's really, and it's, the, the the thing that really got me interested in it is like it's a world known traditional method of therapy for women like 
in all these countries all over, like, okay, the Middle East, like, South Africa, like, um, um, yeah, definitely Africa, South America, like, all of these countries, all through Europe, like, it's not like, oh, this is in some little part of Brazil. Like, women have been doing this all over the world. Um, so that really, I was like, wow, like, that makes a lot of sense to, to, like, really pay attention to something that, like, women have just been raving about over history. <laughs> Yeah, so there's definitely, I mean, the herbs is like a big, like, huh, that's a, that's a question. And there's like specific herbs for specific issues. You can steam with nothing, basically just hot water, right? But the herbs will enhance the steam. And then, I mean, when I've steamed, I've either just gone online and been like, oh, what's good? <laughs> Which you're probably not going to get like the exact, um, you know, like dosage and everything that you need. Um, uh, but there's also companies now that are popping up in America that you can actually order, like, um, depending on your symptoms, like a, a blend that's specific to that. So that's a nice option, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and there's, um, so if you go to Steamy Chicks, it's a website <laughs> that is actually really, really nice because um, you can order herbs from them and you can order a stool from them, but you can steam even That's without a stool. Really yeah, the stool. I mean, that would help. You can basically just sit over a pot. So it's not, you don't have to. You could do it in a sit, uh, well, that wouldn't work. Some people put like a bowl in their toilet and sit over that. So you can rig it, but like if you got the special stool, I'm sure it would be like way easier and stuff. Um, yeah, I got one a camping toilet. It's like $25 on Amazon or something. And it was just like the plastic, it's like a plastic toilet seat that is meant to put like a plastic bag under for like using it out in the woods. Um, but then I just put the pot under and it works, so. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, yeah, Steamy Chicks. Um, they used to, and I'm hoping they still have it, but you can, part of their website, you can, like, put in your symptoms, and they'll tell you, like, oh, that means you need to steam on this day and this day of your menstrual cycle. So it, like, actually has help like that. Um, all right. Was there any other questions about this part? Mm, yeah, a lot of women use it for postpartum, yeah. Um, the only thing that it can do is increase bleeding. So if you're having issues already, you probably don't want to do that. Like if you're like right in the middle of your heavy period or, you know, then it can increase bleeding. So there are some like, and you shouldn't do it while you're pregnant because it does like open up your cervix slightly. So it would be definitely postpartum, and but it helps with so many things. Yeah. I think it depends on your symptoms, yeah. But like as a maintenance, um, I've heard of cultures doing it like uh, after their periods, like on the last days of their period, they'll do it like every month on the last day of their period or the, those days when it's just like brown, just as like a maintenance to make sure everything came out, yeah. Mm. Yeah, so de definitely things change. Um, it affects, um, so taking ar um, artificial hormones can definitely affect your, um, your cervical mucus, and it definitely can affect your moods. I mean, there's a lot of side effects aside from like, huh, does, how does it affect my cycle? Um, but a lot of them are like getting your body to not ovulate, so obviously that's going to um, change the way that your cervix functions and, um, you know, just all of the cycle and your hormones and everything. Mm, you're talking about the copper IUD, yeah. So the copper IUD, it um, changes your cervical 
um, secretions, right? Because copper is like actually a, a toxin, right? It kills the sperm. So um, that copper and the fact that it's something in there irritating you, it changes the way that your cervix is functioning and is not going to release the, the same, it's not going to function exactly the same way as it would without that, yeah. All right, so I wanted to talk about fertility. Let's see how much time we have. Not very much. Um, maybe if you guys just tell me what you're really interested in hearing about then I can talk about that. I don't know what you guys, what questions you had coming in because there's a lot of, there's like, right, people who want to get pregnant and there's people who don't want to get pregnant. <laughs> That's two different things. Uh -huh. um, PMS would be before your menses start, right? And preconception, what do you mean? Like pre-ovulation? Oh, like what kind of symptoms would you be having in between, like when you ovulate and when you have a missed period? Yes. Yeah. So, um, symptoms, let me see. Yeah. Hmm. Well, I think you would have symptoms similar to a pregnant person because <laughs> you're pregnant. <laughs> yeah. So, like, you you might start being nauseous. You might start having tender breasts. Um, you know, uh, some people get implantation bleeding, which is usually on the eighth or ninth day after after you ovulate, but it could be anywhere from the sixth through the twelfth day. So, which is spotting, right? Um, so, but that's only like one third of the women will get implantation bleeding. Um, and by the way, like if you're Hanafi, then any bleeding in pregnancy is not considered menstruation. So you wouldn't consider, even if you did get spotting, like even when your menstruation was due, some people, it's very rare, but some people will still like menstruate when they're, when they're pregnant. So that doesn't count. Um, whereas the, and I'm not sure about the Maliki opinion, but I know that the Shafi opinion is that you can menstruate when you are um, pregnant. So you would still be charting your cycles as cycles, yeah. Um, what was the other part of that? So you're saying before? Mm, mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, probably the breast tenderness might be similar, um, but probably, I mean, some people get really teary when they're pregnant, so yeah. <laughs> We're kind of just all mixed up in there. <laughs> yeah. SubhanAllah. To chart. Um, so the one that I um, heard about, and I don't use an app. Um, so, right, there's two different ways of charting, right? You can do paper charting or you can do an app. Um, so I wrote it somewhere and I'm trying to find it. Oh, here it is. Um, Kandara. Um, and the reason I believe why this one is specifically good is because it gives you the option to like put in more information than today was my period. You know what I mean? Like you can put in like, oh, cervical signs, mood changes, blah, -dee blah, right? So it's a little better in terms of adding things up. And so let me actually give you these before we move on to talking about other things. Um, if anyone's interested, you guys can come up and get um, charts. So like, actually, let me talk about charting. So there's three different kinds. Sorry, I'm kind of like a, really happy about these charts. <laughs> this is a Muslim sister put together. Um, this one has like, you can chart like every single thing that's happening in your life at that moment. <laughs> there's like a place for everything, your temperature, whether you had intercourse or not, like all kinds of stuff. Um, and then 
And then that one I really like because it's, there's like enough room on there to put details, but there's also the whole year on one paper. So, um, yeah, so whatever works for you is really um, just the, the whole bottom line, and this is like really, 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 really important for women, and it's like actually our Islamic obligation to chart our menses. So, and even when you're trying to get pregnant or not trying to get pregnant, it's so important to know what your cycle is. So, um, depending on the medhab, you might need different information. Like, um, you're definitely going to want to chart, like, the, the time that your menses start every month. Say you got some spotting and then you got some time that it stopped. Like, you want to chart that, not just like, oh, this is all menses, whatever, it stopped for a few, for a day, I'm not going to worry. You know, like, chart what's going on. Um, when did it end? You know, so, also, like, say you're like, oh, do I pray or not? Did I, this is like really a short cycle for me. And when you want to take it to a scholar and ask them a question, like, you really need to know all that information. And for the Shafi school, it's important to um, chart the colors of the blood. Um, as they change. You're like, oh, now it's right, bright red, now it's dark red, now it's yellow. And the colors of the blood, right, are all colors that are not um, clean. Um, you know what I mean? Like, are not, that are in the blood colors, right? So even though the doctor will tell you the brown spotting and the yellow and the pink at the end is not actually period, um, that is period for Muslims. Yeah, so um, it's important. And then um, what's considered your um, clean period is um, going to be what you see all month. So some people are a little more on the yellowish side. Some people are a little more on the whitish side. Obviously, um, ovulation uh, secretions are going to usually be just clear. But in, in diet has a lot to do with that in terms of like color of discharge and stuff like that. But there is a range of um, natural weights that um, happen for different women. <clears throat> so the whole point is like really, really it's important to chart. And also we need to write down um, how long we bled after we had a baby. Um, so have those things like in a really important place like with your passport. <laughs> uh -huh. After giving birth, um, I'm not sure what the norm, the range of normal is. I know that you, you have up to 40 days on the Hanafi school and up to 60 days on the Shafi, and I believe the Maliki. Um, so, but really, if you're resting, your blood is not usually not going to last as long as if you're running around doing things. Like, it's a sign. Because, like, the placenta, you're bleeding from the place where the placenta had separated from your uterus. So it's like a raw cut there, right? And so if you're not resting, then it's harder to heal, right? So, and it's harder for your uterus to go all the way back down and that place to heal up completely and stuff. So um, really, if you're... Um, getting like kind of like a renewed blood after you have the baby after it kind of settled down for the first part then it's probably because you're doing too much and you need to rest it's really important to rest mm-hmm mm. more than one egg in one cycle oh okay mm-hmm um, I don't believe it changes. I believe you would release all the eggs at the same, around the same time, but it might be like, yeah, so, you know, between periods, you mean? Oh, like you have a short cycle. Okay. How many clean days do you have in between? So like 
Okay, so you're probably ovulating like right after your period ends. Yeah, and you may be having more than one egg at that time. That's probably, I mean, the hormones are all like building up to come to ovulation, but so once you ovulate, whatever eggs you're going to, most people are going to have one egg, right? You might have, other people might have more than one, which is more rare. Um, but they're all going to ovulate around the same time. Yeah, because that's when the hormones are releasing eggs. After that, there's no hormones to release any eggs. Yeah. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's definitely a lot harder to get pregnant. Um, so when you're talking about, like, you really, your best chances is to not delay past your early 30s. Once you're getting past that, it becomes a lot harder. Not that you aren't fertile, but it just becomes a lot harder. I'm not sure about the exact numbers of, like, what, um, what the percentages are. I mean, for a young, healthy couple, it's, um, some of us are more fertile than others, but in general, it's like a 20% chance that you would get pregnant every month. Um, so that would, you know, as you get older, be reduced from that. So, yeah. But, I mean, it, no matter how old you are, you're going to, charting and knowing when you're ovulating is, like, going to give you the best chance because you're going to have intercourse at the time that you're fertile, right? Um, yeah. But it's, and it's, it's becoming more and more of a problem, um, not problem, but like a situation that a lot of women are in having children, trying to get pregnant at an older age because a lot of sisters are getting married older. They're like starting their careers first, like, Muslims and non-Muslims, you know, so, and, and that's, a lot of the fertility problems sometimes come in because of that. It's like compound with like older age and then, and then, you know, maybe some health problems and, yeah, I don't know if that answered your question, <laughs> inshallah. Yeah, and it's really amazing, like, um, I mean, it's hard to fit it into this modern, like, uh, configuration of life that we're kind of in here. Um, but like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made women to like really give birth like when they're young. Like everything is much easier at that time. Like childbirth is easier. You know, your body is like you have your strengths to like run after kids. You're like, um, and then subhanAllah, like once you're older and wiser and your kids are older, if you like wanted to do something with your career, you like, um, it's not the end of the world to do that later, right? Because you're like, you're like in your wisest point in your life, right? You have like all this life experience to draw on, right? So, and then you have your kids who can uh, help at home. <laughs> they can feed hubby and you can leave. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so, I don't know. It's, it, I think it, a lot of times we're really, really encouraging young women to, um, get their studies done, which is, it makes a lot of sense for them to be studying if they're not married. But I think that we have to remember that there is a balance that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like we can't get away from our, uh, the way Allah created us to have children young. And so that's like their prime time is to have them young. If we can, you know, if we can do it. <laughs> not, not everything is, is ideal. <laughs> SubhanAllah. Home births? Uh huh. Um, it, I mean, I think it depends on risk factors. So, like, if that woman is older and, oh, she has like this thing going on with her health. So, when you're older, you're more likely to be in that situation because as you age, you have more health, people have more health problems. So it's probably more likely that she wouldn't be able to have a home birth, but that doesn't mean that she couldn't. And I think that anyone who thinks that they might be high risk should talk to a midwife because not everything that 
um, is considered high risk in like in the hospital is necessarily considered high risk at home because um, sometimes the reasons why you had an issue in your past pregnancy uh, or birth is because like you weren't being taken care of like you you didn't know about nutrition you didn't know or like the way that your labor was managed maybe you had a hemorrhage because they were like pulling on your placenta and like basically caused you to hemorrhage or like maybe they even charted in your chart that like oh the baby couldn't um, come out so we had to like do this procedure but it was all because like you weren't allowed to be in a natural position when you were giving birth that was like so like it's a lot harder to push a baby out if you're laying on your back right so there's there's things that like maybe that um, home birth midwife who like basically specializes in natural birth would know about like your story from like how it um, would have like different insight than what um, like a gynecologist would have from that story based on like her knowledge of natural birth where if um, the gynecologist is like a specialist in um, surgical birth right they're not specialists in natural birth. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how old was I? I think I was 24 when I had my first, and I, had, I was 35, or just about to turn 35 when I had my last. Um, and, I mean, it's a good question you're asking because I don't think the labor itself was affected, but the pregnancy. Like, my first two pregnancies, like, I was like fine and then the the second two pregnancies I started to like I got I developed migraines after my third baby I um, started I had like bleeding gums issues which I never had with the first two and so I think those were like signs that like I probably wasn't nourished enough and like and and it was something that like I wasn't getting that advice of like hey like you're on your third kid you need to really pay attention to your nutrition more than you did with the other ones. Like, you're at higher risk for malnutrition because, like, you've been, like, nursing for, like, four years of your life and pregnant for two, and, like, that takes so much out of you. And so as women have more children and are older, for sure, like, at any time, like, dude, just eat really good food. <laughs> because, like, in the, in the end, like, birth... Um, complications, anything that complications with your body, period, your health is going to be way better if you are eating really good food and you're, you know, doing all the things that you need to do for your health, for sure. So, like, that's really important. Uh, well, the major thing in pregnancy is getting enough protein, right? So, like, your protein intake should be, like, number one. Right, like good quality protein, like so I'm definitely not talking like about like hot dogs or like you know, like you wanna like be in the kitchen cooking food, right? <laughs> like you want to be eating eggs, you wanna be eating meat. I mean, if you're a vegetarian, like vegetarians have a hard time keeping up with their um intake. So it's like a lot of times they need to be supplementing and just like eating tons and tons of like dairy and, and eggs to like really maintain because you're you're like basically that baby is meat right? so like you need to be eating protein as like the top priority um, and you need to be eating enough um, so definitely like not skipping meals if you're gonna have a snack it should be like very meaningful um, so like always having like a really healthy snack with you and not skipping meals for sure. Um, certain things that are like very um, damaging to your health are like vegetable oils. So like the kind of oils you eat, cause the fat, the fat is another like really key nutrient in your diet. Cause like the baby's brain is mostly fat. Um, so the, um, so like in, if you're not getting good quality fat, then you're just, it's going to be, it's going to be affect you. And so like the vegetable oils, what I mean is like corn oil, soy, soy oil, 
usually like the everything that we use <laughs> like in the supermarkets right whatever you like any package you read unless it's like from the health food store or something or like you know it's gonna have like um you know sunflower oil canola oil corn oil all of those are actually really like damaging to our bodies so what we want to eat is like what our ancestors ate for like thousands and thousands of years until this modern mess started happening and like what because like these oils they actually are not very easily extracted you need like a, a whole like factory to do that right so like what would a mom in like you know living in some rural place like just eating off the land like what would what oil would she have access to any ideas <laughs> animals exactly like so the fat that's in the so you you need to be eating the skin you need to be having like the fat with the with the meat right um, butter exactly and butter is like a superfood basically so you want to get like really good quality butter like if you're gonna get anything organic like get organic oils um, your um, so really good butter like if it can be like organic grass-fed that would be perfect and just like eat it with everything right and um having fish fish oils are like fish in general is really important because of the iodine um and and the oils so like so many of people um it, throughout history lived near the sea right it's the easiest place you have like the water for transport you have like fish you know it's like right and so like our bodies are really meant to eat fish and the oils that are in the fish are especially important. Um, so if we're not eating all of the damaging oils, then, um, you know, we have to be, I mean, we need to be eating the healthy oils no matter what. But the damaging oils makes it even more important for us to be eating the healthy oils to, like, offset that, the, what you had offset. Um, like to bring the balance back in and that's why people take like cod liver oil and whatever fish oils because they're like we have like a really the general American has a really offset imbalance yeah but you know so get those out of your diet and try to get eat like safe fish and seaweed if you can yeah yeah I mean I mean it's especially because like you're breastfeeding and it actually takes more calories to breastfeed than it does to be pregnant um, so yeah like the mommy brain a lot of that is the fact that you're just like you really need to be nourished right um, and so yeah and part of that is like being able to assimilate your nutrients um, so it's like um, there's so many pieces to it. <laughs> like, I can't just, like, say it all, you know. But it's like we have to have enough acid in our stomach in order to digest. And um, so, like, having, like, pickles and things like that and having enough salt in your diet. Fermented, fermented, food. fermented foods. Like, our ancestors, I don't know. Like, when I was in Syria, I feel like that's the only time I've really seen people that are, like, eating really close to what they ancestrally ate. And, like, they have pickles with every meal, right? Um, and they eat yogurt, like, all these probiotic foods, right? Um, they eat yogurt with pretty much every meal, too. Um, so it's, like, these things need to be, like, on our table every meal. Like, you need to have some sort of protein. You need to have some sort of carb. You need to have um, salted food. Salt is, like, a very important nutrient for pregnant people. And in general, for anyone, right? You need you need to have salt to have the balance of liquids in your body be correct, um, and also to digest uh, meat, you need salt. Um, so, and you know, having vegetables like generally, native peoples didn't eat a lot of salad; they ate cooked vegetables, right? And if they had um, raw vegetables, they were fermented because vegetables are actually really hard to digest. Um, so, and that's why we put salad dressing on our, on our, on our salads, because it's, it, the acids and the oil help us to assimilate those nutrients in there. So it's actually not the best practice to, like, 
um, put like a handful of kale in like a smoothie because it's like is it does it have all the fat and does it have the, the things that are gonna help me to digest this if it's just like a lot of raw right because our digestive system is like more closely related to like a um, it, like a carnivore than an herbivore right so so like cows and stuff they have like four stomachs so they can digest like tons of vegetables right so I'm not saying don't eat vegetables I'm <laughs> saying like <laughs> Like think, think fermented, right? Think like, don't think like I can survive on like just big salads, right? Because like you're trying to grow a baby and have like really healthy hormones. Like you really need to focus on your proteins and focus on, um, you know, olive oil. I mean, olive oil is excellent, but we shouldn't be like doing frying in it or something like that. It's like the best places to put it on your salad. Yeah. So with cooking, you do like either in animal fats or in ghee, like butter, you can't do high heat cooking either, but ghee is like really, really healthy. Um, and then coconut oil also works. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, I know. Well, I do have my website, but mm, I wish. <laughs> well, um, well, I would recommend the Nourishing Traditions. It's a it's a cookbook, um, but it has all kinds of nutritional information in it. So it's almost like a book in nutrition, and then a cookbook. And um, so it's based on um, on traditional eating, and which oh uh, no! But she the, the the lady who wrote it, um, Sally Fallon. She has like that's like her main book. But then she has like oh, feeding kids and broths, and she has like all these different books now. Yeah. So I think she might have some specialty books in there. But I know, and it's so much conflicting information, and I think a lot of it, like, too, is because we're not well. Like, a lot of these diets out there are, like, to treat our illnesses, where, like, if we were healthy, we should be able to eat bread. We should be able to, like, you know, just eat, like, all kinds of things and have, like, a healthy weight and stuff like that. But because we're not well, it's like we're using all these things to treat ourselves which might be really help like really help us but they're not like a long-term solution you know and so like the reason why it makes so much sense to me to eat like traditional ways is because like that is tried and true over history you know mm. I mean it, technically we don't need them if we're eating well right and if you're going to take supplements, you should always take, like, whole food supplements. Like, don't, don't, like, buy the cheapest supplements. Like, it's really important for it to be in a food form because otherwise your body doesn't recognize it. And so most of it you will not absorb. So then your body just needs to get up, right? Yeah, because it's like it doesn't know that's food, right? Yeah, yeah like, whole food version. Yeah, like whole food versions. Yeah, exactly. You yeah, have my card here if you want to take that. Yeah, inshallah. Yeah, but it's called um, Soulful Passage, soulfulpassage.com. And um, I think there's a link also on the Facebook. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, so midwives um, are trained to do well woman checkups. So they'll do like a pap smear and like breast exam and like um, all the stuff that like the regular routine stuff that your gynecologist would do. Um, and also like because it's it's like an alternate, it's like a natural health practitioner who's dealing with like um, trying to get you through the pregnancy as healthy as possible. She's definitely going to be like, Let's see your, you know, like, what are you eating? And, like, because a lot of whatever you're going through is because of deficiencies in your diet. So that's, like, a big part of what they do. 
No, I mean, there's a lot of different, like, um, not, uh, alternative medical um, methods that will treat female issues. And, I mean, it's just, like, really, um, I, like, when you're saying that, I'm just remembering, like, the statistics that I've heard on, like, women's health in particular. Like, we've gotten, like, a really hard rap in terms of, like, how well we're being treated by the medical industry. Um, like women have like really high rates of like these these surgeries like you know hysterectomy and like you know like uh, gynecological surgeries like there's women's statistics are not looking good and it doesn't I don't think it's from the fact that we have more issues it's from the fact that like we're not being treated properly you know and a lot of times women aren't listened to and um you know like it's just normal symptoms but it's like we like i went to um this gynecologist for um for like and i was asking her about like irregular periods and she was like oh well I'll, the only thing we really can do for you is put you on the pill I was like, that's not gonna solve anything that would like cover up the symptoms like this is saying something about my body like what that's it so i was like okay I will not bother <laughs> with you. But, I mean, it's not their fault, but it's like the system that they're teaching, right? Um, and I wanted to, it's like after time, If I don't know if you guys can stay a little bit longer. Um, I definitely wanted to mention some things about contraception in terms of halal and haram, because I think that's a really big question out there. Um, so, um, Obviously, like, I'm sure we all know that in Islam, it's encouraged to have kids. <laughs> so the origin of it is that we have children, right? So using contraception is something that is a decision that you need to make between, did he turn it off? I don't know. Between the husband and wife, right? So this decision, because it is your right as a married person to have children, so if you are not on board with contraception, then, or your husband isn't, then like that is not a decision that either of you can make on your own. To be like, well, I'm getting my tubes tied and I don't care what you say. <laughs> That's not halal, right? Both of you have the, have the right to have children and have a say in that decision. That's a family decision. And it's, you know, so women can't do things secretly and not tell their husband that's not okay. Um, um, I don't know how to solve those disputes. <laughs> sure you, it would be a case by case situation. I know. He's like, get me a maid, and then it's all good. <laughs> okay. Um, so, but according to the majority of scholars, um, contraception in general, the idea of it is halal, and um, they were the Sahabi were doing coitus interruptus, which is withdrawal, um, during the time of the Prophet ﷺ, and there was nothing that that forbid it. But the Prophet ﷺ said, you know, you can do that, but um, it's in Allah's hands what if you're going to get pregnant or not. So um, it's always in Allah's hands, right? Subhanallah. Um, all right. Um, and there's a m minority opinion that says it is disliked to use contraception, but that is um, when there's a reason for the contraception, then that dislikedness goes away. Um, yeah. And poverty is not an excuse for not having children. So um, Allah promises us in the Quran that he will provide for each child, and so many people really know that to be the case, um, just because, you know, you can always, they've been able to sustain their families, even though it, their families are growing, and um, the, um, the statistics are for large families. Children are more stable, the, the family, like, they're not as spoiled, they're more resilient because, like, you want to raise a child that's like, 
ready for the world, right? Not like pampered and they can't do anything, right? You want them to get up and leave, <laughs> right? They want it, you want this robust like teenager that's like, okay, see you later. I got all the tools I need. You did a great job. I'm ready, you know? And you're like, whew, alhamdulillah, <laughs> right? Um, so like people who don't have a lot, they have to be creative. They have to learn how to like make thing out of something out of nothing. And those skills like are best taught when they have to be learned, right? You feel like you get up and clean your room. Like that's different than like um, you're gonna sleep in grandma's room, so grandma's gonna like. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like there's a necessity here, and you gotta make it work, and you gotta like hold your own and be like be mature and like whatever. I just a scenario, but you know what I mean? Like when you're like, okay, we're poor, and you gotta like make some money, do something, you know, like then this child's going to be like, oh, wow, I got to figure it out. I got to take the bus. I got to do this. And they're going to be like this amazing adult that can like do so much. So like when you have a lot of kids, that happens organically. <laughs> and like, so your kids end up stronger. And so it's like, you know, it's tough, but it's actually a really big benefit. And it's a big benefit for, um, for the mom too, like we grow so so much spiritually having children, but we also um, it's good for our bodies actually, like less breast cancer, less osteoporosis, um, and you know, like we're doing something that our bodies were meant to do, and we're like in our natural state actually. <clears throat> um, and I got off the topic of why we should okay contraception. Um, um, there's also uh, an opinion, I'm not sure if this is the major opinion, or I, I guess I would, if I was interested in getting an IUD, I would maybe ask more, but it's saying that if there, because there, if there's another alternative to it, then you should avoid that because that kind of birth control involves you uncovering your nakedness in front of the doctor so they can place the IUD and then it's not permissible to uncover your nakedness for no good reason, like if you can avoid that, right? So, I mean, but it's like all about like whether you think you can avoid that or not. Um, I know a lot of people are using the copper IUD because they want to avoid um, having um, hormones and that's a very legitimate fear. I mean, the hormones can cause all kinds of things to be changed in your body. So, um, you know, it's something to consider. Um, not that the copper IUD is completely free of risk. There are things that you need to consider about that as well. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think, where is other um, sanctions? This or that. Yeah, and um, whenever you're using contraception, like the first and foremost rule in Islam is no harm. So if you're going to cause harm to your body, then um, it is not something that is advisable, right? And the, um, what was I going to say? Uh, definitely any forms of uh, birth control that are permanent are not allowed unless there is like a very serious issue. Like say the mom has like mental issues to the point where she's like, you know, seriously depressed, if she had another child, they're like really worried about her mental stability, then she could possibly like, you go to a Muslim doctor that is, you know, fears a lot and like ask their opinion, right? But there are reasons for maybe like, you know, their health is so bad that it just would really harm them um, to have more kids, whatever it is, that it's a very big need then that is like a pious doctor has said like this is what really should happen, um, then, then a permanent um, kind of birth control like tying your tubes or the husband getting a vasectomy would then become, well no, it doesn't have to do the husband then if it's the wife's health. Yeah. Because he might want to have, get married and have other kids. All right. But you know, he does, it's not lawful to do permanent forms of birth control. Yeah. All right. Any last questions? Do you want me to turn off the recording? <laughs> okay.